Hi everybody, this is Mark Graben from Kinexus. I'd like to welcome you to today's webinar titled Building the Fit Organization presented by Dan Markovitz. And before I introduce Dan, we have just a few logistical details to cover real quickly. Dan's gonna present for about 40 to 45 minutes. We're gonna leave time for Q&A at the end of Dan's uh, presentation. So along the way, please help level load the input of questions. You can use the GoToWebinar uh, control panel that uh, hopefully looks something like that on your computer to enter questions uh, along the way as they occur to you. And we will answer those as uh, a batch at the end of the session. But and uh, we'll, we'll have uh, a good Q&A session, I'm sure, as well as a great presentation from Dan. We will send out a link to uh, a recording and, uh, and slides via email, or you can see there's a relatively new feature within GoToWebinar called Handouts, which uh, hopefully uh, you see that and you can click and view those slides. But I'd recommend just going along for the ride with Dan here. He's got an engaging presentation and let the slides develop um, as, as he goes. And so with that, uh, let me go ahead and uh, introduce Dan. Um, Really happy to have uh, Dan Markovitz here today. He founded Markovitz Consulting uh, to help organizations become faster, stronger, and more agile through the application of lean principles to knowledge work. He's worked with nonprofit and governmental organizations and businesses, uh, including uh, the New York City Department of Health, Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center, W.L. Gore & Associates, Abbott Vascular, and Camelback. Dan is a faculty member at the Lean Enterprise Institute. He teaches regularly at the Stanford University Continuing Studies Program and the Ohio State University's Fisher School of Business. His first book, which uh, I really enjoyed and highly recommend, uh, was titled A Factory of One. It was honored with a Shingo Research Award in 2013. Dan lived in Japan for four years and is fluent in Japanese. Uh, he received a BA from Wesleyan University and an MBA from the Stanford Graduate School of Business. Uh, so with that, Dan, I'll advance the slide and turn it over to you. Thank you very much, Mark, and thanks for having me. One problem is that we, when we talk about lean and improvement, we end up, the first place we go is Toyota. We start talking about Toyota, and this makes sense because, of course, Toyota uh, invented lean, really, uh, in, in many respects. Uh, but I think that this creates a big problem. Uh, the first thing is that there is a natural uh, resistance. People start thinking immediately when you say Toyota, they, they sit back, they cross their arms, literally or metaphorically, and they uh, say, you know, we, uh, we're not a car company, we're a hospital, we are a bank, we're an insurance company, uh, we make paper, whatever it happens to be. Uh, we're not a Toyota, why are you telling me about cars? And then there is another issue. Uh, we, the fact is that Toyota is so advanced um, that and they've been after doing this for 60 years or so that looking at Toyota is, I think, uh, is like looking at Michael Phelps and saying, uh, I would like to be learn to swim, so I'm going to start copying the training program and training regimen of Michael Phelps. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Michael Phelps is, without a doubt, uh, the world, the greatest swimmer in history. Uh, he has 18 gold medals, I think two silvers and a bronze, uh, over three Olympics. Uh, and for you to try to copy his training would be absurd because he's so inconceivably advanced that you would end up getting hurt or getting frustrated and quitting. Or if you were interested in running, for me to say, well, you want to go, you want to start training, uh, here, follow the training program of Mo Farah. Mo Farah is British, you can tell from his jersey. Uh, he won two Olympic golds, and he has five gold medals in world championships in the 5,000 and 10,000 meters, and he's probably the greatest distance runner alive right now. And so when we look at Toyota, we're saying, hey, why don't you start? Uh, why don't you start running like Mo Farah? Why don't you start uh, swimming like Michael Phelps? And I think that that's crazy. What I think is important, um, or I think one reason that that companies have struggled in their lean, uh, lean initiatives, is that we talk about Toyota, we start ta we start copying a company that's too far advanced, and we start using a language and and examples that aren't relevant to us. So my belief is that if we could start using a language, if we start putting the 
the lean uh, 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 concepts into a language that anyone can relate to, into experience that anyone can relate to, I believe that we might have a greater chance of reaching people's hearts and minds and getting them to embrace, understand and embrace lean. And so my book really is an effort to tell the lean story without talking about Toyota. Uh, without using any Japanese, there's not going to be any Heijunka boards, there's no, there's no conversations about kamishibais and things like this, and uh, there's, no, uh, ja there's no lean jargon. What I want to do is tell the lean story in basic language that anyone can understand. In my book, I talk about six principles, and I'm going to walk you through them uh, in order. Obviously, I can't go into as much detail as I would like for this short webinar, but I think it'll be enough to make sense for you. Uh, so the first idea is committing to improvement. Um, and the, the fitness metaphor, fitness analog to this would be committing to fitness. You know, if you think about going to the gym, uh, or if you, if you go to the gym, the busiest day of the year is January 2nd or January 3rd, depending on when the holiday falls and all that. Uh, but it's the first day of the year. People get all excited, and they're, they charge into the gym, and uh, the place is packed tighter than people are packed into their spandex. Uh, you can hardly get a machine. You can't find any room to do anything. But within a week or two weeks, things die down, and pretty soon you're back to normal. But if you want to get fit, you really need to commit to improvement, not once a quarter, not once a month, not once at the beginning of the year, not even once a week, but every day. What you really want to do is embed fitness into the daily fabric of your life. Uh, I actually, I saw this, <laughs> I saw this slide somewhere on the internet. It just made me, it made me laugh. Uh, so here's a kid who clearly is interested in Frosted Flakes. Uh, he's got it, Frosted Flakes four times during the day, and he has embedded it into his daily existence. And I think about the fitness in the same way. If you have a fitness program, the odds are good you're going to slip off of it. Yes, you do want to know you're going to go to a gym or you're going to be running or doing some swimming or something like that. But more importantly, you want to be able to say, I'm going to bike to work twice a week or I'm going to take the stairs uh, or at least part of the time or some of the flights. Uh, I'm going to walk to the grocery store instead of just drive. You want to be embedding it into the fabric of your daily life. Now, when you think about... Um, Companies, what they often do with lean is they don't embed it. It's very episodic. It's like going to the gym once a month. They say, well, we're going to do a Kaizen event once a month. We'll get 12 a year. Or we'll do a Kaizen event once a quarter. We'll get four a year. And so we have, uh, we have this three weeks a month. We are not doing anything different. And one week a month, we're doing a Kaizen event. And that's like going to the gym once a week. It's like for this kid having Frosted Flakes just once a week. That's just not enough. And so what we really want to do is make improvement, make fitness part of life, daily life, embedded in the DNA of the company. And one place to start is by getting rid of these things. This was actually, it was actually Mark Rabin who pointed this out to me about a year ago, that if you Google suggestion box, you see page after page after page of boxes, all of which come with locks, which really makes no sense. It's like saying that um, ideas are, are dangerous wild animals that have to be kept under lock and key. Uh, what is more, a much more effective way of handling this is to think about making ideas visible, bringing them out into public. So you can have a simple Kaizen submission form. Uh, this is just one mock-up, of course. You can have plenty of other ones that are either a little more elaborate or a little less elaborate. But the idea is that rather than having employee ideas locked up in a box where a manager or supervisor or VP will evaluate it, once a year or every six months or even once a month. Uh, we want to have these things open in plain view so people see this is part of the way we operate. And here's a very simple board from the Catholic Charities in Fort Worth. It's an improvement board with their backlog of ideas or the suggestions, the ones that are going to work on, the ones that they're doing, and the ones that are completed. This is a really powerful way of telling everyone that, that improvement is something that we're committed to, that we're working on all the time. It's not some sort of special episodic event. It's not something we do once a month or once a quarter. And of course, if you want people to be 
bringing it into the fabric of their life. Uh, you want to be able to see how things are going. You want to um, capture them. You want to show what, what, prob what projects are being done. You want to show the metrics. And most importantly, you also want to be able to celebrate because we are animals and we do seek pleasure and rewards. And the fact that we can celebrate is something that makes people say, yeah, this, this improvement stuff, this is really good. I want to be able to do this. And this is no different really than fitness, whether you're celebrating some weight loss or celebrating a, new, a faster time or a new, uh, the longest distance that you ever run. You celebrate the fact that you've hit these goals, you've accomplished something. So it shouldn't just be this daily slog through enemy fire, but rather improvement should be something that we, we, we stop, we recognize, and we take pride in. And in fact, this is a uh, screenshot from a third-party logistics company. And you can see they have captured all of their improvements. This is in the warehouse, um, and you can see the Wall of Fame. And there is, this is only one of the walls of the Wall of Fame. But when you walk through this facility, you get the sense you know that this company is really serious about improvement that they're dedicated to it, that they're committed to it, that it's part of their daily life. It's not just something they do once in a while. One of the other things that's very important in instilling or embedding the improvement ethos into the DNA of the company is, well, it comes from point eight of Dr. Deming. Uh, you have to drive out fears so that everyone can work effectively for the company. And there is an enormous amount of fear that people are not really conscious of. There's an enormous amount of fear that goes on that, um, that all the well-stocked refrigerators of well, Red Bull and all the, all the discounted snacks or free uh, snack cupboards at the office will not get rid of. People, of course, are afraid of getting fired. But more than that, they're also afraid of perhaps um, being laughed at. They're afraid of being ridiculed. They're afraid of being ignored. I've suggested something and my manager has ignored me or hasn't responded at all or has criticized the work I did. They're afraid of hearing about something on their annual performance review that says, gee, you didn't do something quite right. And so people are anxious and they're nervous and it's very hard to get people to embrace improvement and to try things and perhaps fail if they're scared. There's another aspect of fear that I think is really powerful that we often ignore. You hear people say, well, we're taking on lean or we're doing some sort of continuous improvement. We've got to do something that moves the needle. Everyone's very into moving the needle these days. They want to move the needle on the business. And they don't want to do anything small. And I think that is a fundamental error. Professor Bob Maurer at uh, UCLA He's a psychologist, and he talks about the importance of small steps. He says that if you try to make a big change or take a big step, you're going to activate the amygdala, which uh, is where the fight or flight, uh, the lizard brain, where the fight or flight uh, instinct resides. And if you say you're going to change something dramatically, people automatically get very, very anxious, they get afraid, and they freeze. Uh, he points out that if you want someone to go, who, someone is, let's say, obese or is a heavy smoker and they are cruising for a, for a heart attack and an early death, he says you can't tell them they have to go to the gym every single day and they have to lose 30 pounds. Uh, it's just not going to work. They're going to freeze up. Instead, he says, you tell them, listen, what I'd like you to do is walk one minute a day. Or while you're walk, watching TV, get on a treadmill for two minutes. Or walk around the house. Very, very simple stuff. Let's do that. That's not threatening. Anyone can do it. And then the next week, you increase it. Let's walk for two minutes. Let's walk for three minutes. Let's walk for five minutes. And this, I think, is really important because what we're doing is gradually getting people into the mode of embracing improvement. In fact, there's a company that, uh, called Hydroflask. Some of you may have their products. They make insulated aluminum uh, flasks to hold beverages. Uh, they started their improvement journey by trying to figure out uh, why the coffee pot kept running out of coffee. They're in Oregon, and it's gray and cold and dark in Oregon in the winter, and people are very into their coffee. So this was a big thing for them. It didn't move the needle on the business, but the process of solving this problem was really important. They under started to learn the plan, do, study, adjust process. And once they did that, they had more coffee, and they said, hey, that was kind of fun. Let's do something else. 
I, if you would go back to the to the metaphor of a um, of fitness, here's a guy who is an Olympic weightlifter. I promise you, he didn't start weightlifting with all of those. He started with a much much lighter barbell. If you are getting ready to run a marathon, you don't do a 20 mile run, or for those of you who are in metric speaking countries, you don't do a uh, 35 kilometer run your first day out. You start with a two kilometer run. You start with a one mile run, and you work your way up. We're dealing with building improvement muscle, and I think if you're going to improve, mu build improvement muscle, you have to start small in a way that's non-threatening and you don't get hurt. And in fact, I think one of the guys who really exemplifies this the best is a gentleman by the name of Paul Akers, who wrote a book called Two Second Lean. And his challenge to his company, they're in the Pacific Northwest also, coincidentally, his challenge to, the, to his company is to do their jobs every single day just two seconds faster. And if you think about it, there's nothing really dramatic or frightening about two seconds. I could probably figure out a way to set up my tools or my workspace or how to handle my email or whatever it is two seconds faster today. But if you do that day after day, week after week, month after month, by the end of the year you have a, a company or an organization that is fundamentally operating differently. And that to me is a really attractive way of not only pursuing fitness, but pursuing improvement and doing it in a way where you can get people to come along with you instead of scaring them. The next topic or the, that I think is important is what I call increasing value or not cutting costs. The fitness metaphor for this is to think about building fitness and not losing weight or trying to lose weight. Uh, some companies, some organizations, they really are fat and they do need to cut costs and, and, and cut, uh, yeah, cut expenses that are, that are unnecessary. But if you go too far down that road, you end up like this. Uh, these are fashion models. They're probably very highly paid because I think this came from Paris or Italy or Milan or something like that. But I think you can make a pretty strong argument that these women are not fit. Yes, they're models, and yes, they're successful, but that does not make them fit or healthy. In fact, the natural, the logical extension of losing weight as a goal is anorexia, which absolutely is not healthy. Organizations also have to worry about this because you can, you'll hear many organizations start saying, is saying we're going to take on lean or continuous improvement or lean six sigma or whatever because we have to cut costs. And that, to me, is the wrong way to approach things. That brings you down to these nearly anorexic models. The epitome of this was a guy named Chainsaw Al Dunlap. I don't know how many of you remember him. He was big stuff in the 80s and 90s. Chainsaw Al would come into companies. His, his, his motto was maximize shareholder value. And Chainsaw Al would come in with slash costs and make fire people and make sure that um, <laughs> He would make sure that every check that went out, out of the, the company had to cross his desk. He personally had to sign it. His last port of call was the Sunbeam Corporation. They make household appliances, for those of you guys who don't know. Chainsaw Al came in. He slashed costs by 60%, uh, 50% or 60%. He laid off 6,000 workers. He cut the product line. And share price, share price went way, 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 right through the roof. Excuse me. Went right through the roof. And um, five years later... Sunbeam was bankrupt because all he did was cut costs. All he did was move towards organizational anorexia instead of trying to increase value and increase capability. There's some research by McKinsey that pointed out the sustainability of cost reduction programs over three years. Only about 10% of organizations that embark on any of these programs retain that more than three years because you think about it. Companies go into, they have these, some sort of crisis, and then they say, okay, travel, we're, we're cutting back on travel, and we're not catering lunches anymore, and we're not bringing, uh, we're not bringing donuts into, the, into meetings, and you have to bring your own coffee, and by the way, we're laying off some people, so I'd like you, Susan, to do the job of your, you and your partner, and just keep working at it. But then the, the crisis pass, passes, and then pretty soon people are traveling a little more, and you're catering lunches, and you're bringing in donuts, and Susan, who's now been stressed out for three years, says, uh, I need some help, and they hire someone. 
because we haven't increased the value, we haven't increased the capability of the organization, and we haven't improved the ability of the organization to operate well. If we start thinking instead about increasing value, we get the benefits of improved revenues, and we get the ability to grow even more because we're meeting customer needs. This is something that a nurse manager said from the Franciscan St. Francis Healthcare in uh, Indianapolis. And she was, she really struggled. She couldn't come up with any ideas. She couldn't uh, contribute to lean because she says, I thought we were supposed to come up with ideas for reducing costs and I couldn't think of any. But when you explain that Kaizen was about saving time, making our work easier and improving patient care, I realized I had a lot of ideas after all. And the truth is that just trying to cut costs is dispiriting. It's emotionally draining. It's not exciting or invigorating. And this nurse manager was in that boat. But when she realized that she could take care of patients better, she had a ton of ideas. So she understood now, finally understood, that, that lean that is, is about improving or increasing value. So what does that look like? Well, for her, it's improving patient care. Uh, for this company, this is Wild Things Gear, and Ed Schmoltz is the president there, and he said, I love this quote from him, he says, who am I to tell the customer his jacket is ugly? If any of you are outdoors people, you know you go to REI or you go to uh, Dick's Sporting Goods, you go to some store, and you have a couple of uh, jackets on the, on, the sh on the shelf or on hangers, and if you don't like orange or red, too bad, because that was a color that was decided by a designer sitting in a building who's never met you 18 months ago. Those are the color options you have. And maybe you don't want a hood, but too bad, because that's what they've decided. Ed Schmoltz says, I'm going to let you design your own jacket. So you get to pick the fabric, you get to pick the color, you get to pick whether it has a hood or not, you get to, to choose the kind of cuffs. Um, and if any of you, you can see in this picture on the left side of the chest, there's a green patch there. That's a chest pocket. Um, if any of you are have these jackets, you know that most chest pack pockets are on the left-hand side because 85% of the population is right-handed, so it makes sense to have the pocket on the left. And if you're left-handed, too bad for you. Ed said, that's stupid. Why don't I allow people to put pockets where they want to put pockets? What if, why don't I talk to the 15% the of the people that are left-handed as well? And now you can put the pocket on the left hand or the right hand. Sales have gone up. Customers are happy. He's able to manufacture in the United States, in fact. Um, and uh, his close out, instead of having about 40% right, uh, closeouts, he has about 5%, which is unheard of in this industry. This is a supermarket in the Netherlands, Builder and De Klerk. And they said, why do we make you walk all the way around the outside of the supermarket in order to buy food for your dinner or your lunch? So what they started doing is merchandising all of the ingredients along with a recipe card and a photo of what the meal looks like right in the middle. So what they're doing is making it easier for you to buy stuff for your dinner or your lunch or for your week. There are your meals laid out right there. And not surprisingly, their sales have increased by making it easier for customers. And that is an increase in value, making shopping easier. Bespoke Bicycles in London is in a very competitive space. This is very, very high-end bicycles that go anywhere from $3,000 to probably $15,000. And uh, unlike most companies that just, just sell $3,000 to $15,000 bicycles, they actually provide an array of services. One thing they do, for example, is set up the bike exact to meet your needs exactly. So you can see here's a person who is being fit. She's got these motion sensors on her shoulder, on her hip, on her thigh, on her knees. This is what they use, uh, something very similar to what they use when they do computer graphics in movies or computer animation in movies. So they're going to track how she sits and how she rides, and they're going to adjust the bike precisely for her. And this fitting, of course, is an extra fee. Uh, they also do something really cool. They say, gee, uh, if you keep riding the way you're riding, you're going to get injured. So what we need to do is give you some exercises to work on so that your feet are in the right position and you have the proper flexibility. And so they have this room where they're actually helping people become healthier and safer and be, and be able to enjoy riding more. 
So these are all very customer focused in consumer consumer industries. What is what does increasing value look like in a non-consumer oriented industry? There is a children's uh, hospital down in Texas. The, there are under enormous pressures. Uh, those of you, even if you're not in the United States, you probably know that uh, our healthcare industry is under enormous pressure financially. Uh, these guys were dealing with an MRI wait time of 16 weeks and the imaging department was facing staff cuts and they said, well, instead of cutting staff, let's see if we can figure out a way to get more people in, increase value. They reworked their processes. They were able now to see people within two weeks and urgent patient needs within one day. So not only do they increase value by reducing the wait time, they actually increase their revenue by $5 million a year. As you think about increasing value, what I'd like you to consider is creating process-oriented key performance uh, measurements, KPIs. Uh, so if you're in HR, for example, maybe you could start looking at the percentage of new hires that have everything ready on their first day, computer passwords and keys and chairs and everything they need. If you're in product development, you could look at the percentage of sales samples that are delivered on time or the time from concept to first prototype. If you are in customer service, you could look at your customer renewal rate. Or if you're in finance, you could take a look at the percentage of accounts receivable that are less than 90 days. If you start creating KPIs that are oriented around the process, it gives you an opportunity to start focused on creating more value instead of just doing business as usual or cutting costs. You'll notice that none of these are actually uh, revenue-oriented metrics, not directly revenue-oriented. So the third idea that I'd like to present is to think horizontally. And you might consider this having a, in, a, in a fitness world, having a training plan or training for a specific event. If you are planning on running a marathon, for example, um, you are going to be doing different kinds of exercises in order to be ready for a 42 kilometer run. Uh, then you are going to, and you're gonna have different exercises if you're going to be an Olympic power lifter. Um, clearly, different kinds of muscles, different kind of strength, different kind of flexibility and capacity and capability needed. And if you are one of the CrossFit junkies, you are going to want, again, different kind of training in order to be ready for the World Reebok CrossFit Games. And amazingly enough, there actually is something called the Reebok World CrossFit Games. Now, the analog in an organization is the idea that we have these functional silos and we tend to cram all of the product for all of the customers through these functional silos. This is one particular um, value stream that I've just mocked up here that you've got your new product development, marketing, design, development, engineering, and so on. And we shovel all the products through there. And yet that's not really necessarily the best way to do it. From my perspective, that would be like doing the same exercises and the same training regimen regardless of what event you're training for, an Olympic powerlifting event or the Stockholm Marathon. And that doesn't make any sense. Thinking horizontally means thinking about what type of customer you're trying to solve. Instead of being, instead of, or solve, <laughs> serve, I should say. So customer type one, two, and three, and who knows how many you have, we should be thinking about what they need and how to serve them rather than thinking about the functional silo in which we exist. And when you think about it, most of our work really is pointed and most of our measures are pointed internally. So for example, if you're in the credit department, you're focused on reducing the day sales outstanding, regardless of whether or not that's good for uh, certain customers may need different, different uh, amount of latitude. Um, if you are in sales, your focus is on meeting the month or meeting the quarter or meeting the year, and so you may be shoveling things out the door that's not good for manufacturing or it's not good for logistics and distribution and so on. And so rather than thinking about what our department needs, we should instead be thinking about what our customers need. So one example of this is the aluminum trailer company, which makes, this is gonna be shocking for all of you, I know, they make aluminum trailers and here's their office. They used to be broken up into silos like a lot of companies um, and it turns out that there are communication among all the various departments, sales, design, engineering, the customer coordinator, and so on. Uh, 
was just terrible. It was the company is laid out end to end. end, to end it's about uh, 200 yards. And again, if you are um, <laughs> If you're speaking, if you're in a metric con con company, that's about 180 meters or so, uh, from 200 yards round trip from one end of the company to the other, and communication was terrible. People would just send emails back and forth. Steve Brenneman, the president of the company, said this is no good. So what he did was instead put all of the people. He divided his company into three, uh, his his customers into three different types. He has. Uh, what he calls, and he admits is not very clever, value stream one, value stream two, and value stream three. And value stream one is for customers that just want off-the-shelf trailers. Value stream two is for customers that want trailers that are some that have some minor customization and modifications. And value stream three is for customers who want something, uh, as he calls it, a snowflake, something entirely customized. Which, uh, which has something different for uh, everything is dis different. It could be a mobile emergency command center following a, um, an earthquake, say, or it could be a trailer used by a police SWAT team, things like that. And those are intensely, uh, intensely labor-intensive and custom designed. So Steve ended up organizing his team so you have a coordinator, a salesperson, a designer, an engineer working together in one room. And what you're looking at is one of those rooms that they're all in. Uh, the communication has improved dramatically, and the lead time has gone from seven weeks to two weeks. That, to me, is a pretty remarkable improvement. One quick, I'll tell you a little bit about a, uh, a work that I used to do when I was, my, one of my first jobs, I used to work at ASICS, and I was actually brought in to be, although we didn't use the, word, the words at the time, the value stream manager for the specialty running stores, uh, especially running and triathlon stores. These guys have terrible credit. They're horrible business people. Uh, mostly they're there opening their stores as a, as a labor of love and the opportunity to get discounted shoes for their own running or swimming or biking or whatever. And these guys um, have very different needs from the big chains like Foot Locker. And so what I was able to do for them was to create different policies and different procedures and different measurements just for them. So for example, our finance department was very, uh, as you would imagine, very concerned about inventory levels, trying to keep inventory down. But these guys are very bad at pr predicting how many sh sh shoes they're going to need over the course of a season. So we created a special shoe bank for them where we reserved inventory just of the two models that they carried the most of and just in the core sizes. So for men, that'd be sizes 9, 10, and 11, and for women, it'd be 7, 8, and 9. And we would keep that inventory so that they would have fill-in orders whenever they needed to have fill-in orders. We changed the customer service for them. Instead of dumping their phone calls into a, spe into a generic or the general customer service uh, number, we gave them a special number with our best customer service agents who were able to resolve their better able to resolve their problems. And we did other things like that. Oh, we did one other thing we did, we, we started to bring product in, shoes in from the factories in China two weeks early. And we would distribute it to them or deliver it to them two weeks before we would send it to Foot Locker. Because Foot Locker and Foot Action, Dix and all those guys, they discount the shoes by about five dollars as soon as they come in. And these guys can't afford to give up five dollars worth of margin. So we gave it to them two weeks early so they would have the opportunity to sell at full price without competition. So what we were doing was creating systems and support for different kinds of customer bases. And that's what thinking horizontally is. The fourth idea is standard work. Uh, now this is something that uh, most people are familiar with uh, from the old t uh, training within the industry world. This, of course, is a nice little screenshot of uh, breaking the job down, describing what goes into TWI. And oftentimes we think about, about standard work. We think about a way to do our job for things that are very repetitive, frontline work. This is a company that has the standard work written out for, um, for, the, cust for the customer service teams. How do we handle shipping, uh, various uh, shipping questions? And actually, one of the things that's really neat about this is that they phrase all the question, the, the standard work in the language of the customer service team. The customer service people, of course, create this. And so uh, they phrase it not as here's how to do something, but here's the problem I sometimes face. Look, the customer service rep is not here. How can I process and key in an event account? 
So we tend to think about this as something that is, a, there's a right way to do these repetitive tasks. There's a standard work for it. But just like there's a right way to exercise, there's a right way to run, there's a right way to swim, there's a right way to do powerlifting, back to the powerlifting guy, there is a right way to lead. There are standard ways for leaders to operate. This is an example of a standard work board, or part of a standard work board, from the COO of Stanford Healthcare. There's a guy named James Hereford, and you can see he has, you can actually only see 11 of the items. This goes down farther than, than I could take a picture of. Uh, all the things that he wants to do at the start of the week, during the week, and the end of the week. And he measures himself whether uh, he's done it or not, so he can see the red or green magnets as he moves them along. By the way, the reason it's all red in week uh, in the week of January 5 is that, of course, it was uh, it was a holiday uh, because of New Year's. This kind of standard work board is mimicked with his uh, direct reports. This is uh, one of his direct reports. You can see she has written down what she's supposed to be doing on a daily basis and what she's supposed to be doing on a weekly basis, and some of the things she's supposed to be doing on a monthly and quarterly basis. So she has given herself a visual representation of what she's supposed to do. She knows when she's supposed to do it, and she can track her progress on that. This is the standard work that comes from a company called JD Machine. They are in Salt Lake City, and uh, in the, heart, the rows, uh, the swim lanes, are the names and the pictures of the supervisors in the shop floor. And you can see Monday to Thursday, they have a bunch of topics that they're supposed to cover with their teams. And if they do it, the, they get to put a green card up. And if they don't do it, they leave it red. So they can see, for example, on Tuesday, someone didn't cover cost with their team, whereas on uh, the success review was done or delivery was done by some of the other folks. So this is a very clear. Uh, indication of what people are supposed to do at each time. There's a real benefit to having standard work. Uh, James Hereford, the guy from, from Stanford Healthcare, talks about how um, it keeps him from getting bogged down in administrivia. And in fact, what we find often is that having too many things to do is paralyzing. Uh, that the more you have to choose from, the less able you are to actually make a decision and act. And this came about by uh, from research from this woman, Sheena Angar, in a book called The Art of Choosing. It turns out, by the way, she did a wonderful, uh, wonderful research on this for her PhD. It turns out you actually didn't need to get a PhD from Stanford like she did. The Simpsons called this a long time ago, where they found that too many choices make shopping a baffling ordeal. And in fact, there's one other aspect of too many decisions that's tough, and that is that uh, we encounter decision fatigue. There's a wonderful article in Vanity Fair magazine about President Obama. Uh, when he became president, he got rid of uh, everything except blue and gray suits and, blue, uh, and uh, red and blue ties because he says, I've got so many decisions I need to make during the course of a day. The last thing I need to do is fatigue myself by trying to figure out what I'm supposed to wear. The fifth idea is visual management, or what I call real-time feedback. If you walk into a gym, the first thing you see is this. You see mirrors everywhere. Because if you're doing an exercise, if you're doing a squat with 200 pounds on your back, the last thing you want to do is be in the wrong position because you'll blow out your knee. And of course, it's not just mirrors. We get real-time feedback from our Nike fuel bands and our Fitbits and our jawbones, jaw jawbreakers, whatever they are, and Apple Watches and so on. So we are programmed, in a way, to expect that when we're doing some sort of exercise, we get real-time feedback. And yet, when you go into an office, what you normally see is something that looks like this. How are these people working? Are they ahead? Are they behind? Are, is their work of quality, or is it not of quality? We want to think about is how can we make this work visible so that we're able to get real-time feedback on how the work is being done, and then we can make we can take actions to improve or rectify the situation. Here's a very simple example from a manufacturing facility of golf clubs. They can see the work they're supposed to do today and the work they're supposed to do tomorrow. Notice that it's color coded, and they can see immediately whether they're ahead or behind. Now you can see do the same thing in an office. Here's the invoice processing schedule at one company. 
you can see the top two rows are Evelyn and Sue, and their invoices are broken out in two-hour buckets, and you can see when those invoices are supposed to be processed. You can tell immediately whether they're ahead or behind. You can have get real-time feedback on what's supposed to be done. This is a picture from ThetaCare. Uh, they, are, they organize uh, training events both at home, at what they call home, and away at hospitals for their member hospitals. And when they want to do an education experience at home, this lists everything that's supposed to be done and the date that it's supposed to be done by. So you can see immediately whether they're on target or not. The red dots indicate that something's been missed. You can also have visual tools that help you give out signals like warning. Here, this red, uh, sorry, this green sash is being used at a lot of hospitals, particularly Kaiser Permanente, because they found that medication errors are often often occur when a nurse is dispensing medications, because people would ask them, "Hey, I have a question. It's just a quick question. Do you know where whatever it happens to be?" And when they wear the sash, that means "Do not disturb. I'm in the middle of dispensing medicine." And in fact, medication errors have gone down dramatically. Real-time feedback look, can look like this. This is from a law firm. This is a seven-person patent specialty uh, firm that, that, uh, that registers patents. And they, are, um, uh, they manage their work on these cards. In the middle red box, you see all these little cards that indicate the client work that needs to be done. The orange circles on those cards indicate how many days the manager, the managing partner expects it to take each person to do. And that red box is two weeks' worth of work. The green box to the right is all the work that needs to be done farther out than two weeks. In the yellow box on the left, you can see the names of the people that are working there. So there are six attorneys there. And the blue box uh, is the headers for three vertical columns of patent applications in critical stages, things that are going to be filed or needing review or things like that. So he's able to see exactly what's being done and when and know whether he's on target or not. And just as one last, uh, one last picture of this, this is actually a construction company. This is not single family houses. This is a company that does full on office buildings and hospitals and things like this. And this is how they manage their work with a board that gives them real time feedback on what's happening. This last one, by the way, uh, James Hereford, again, the COO of Stanford Healthcare. This is what his office walls look like. These are two of his walls. So he wants real-time feedback on pretty much everything that's going on. It's a little overwhelming for me, but it works for him. So the last idea is what I call the coaching triangle. Um, if you think about great coaching, I believe there are three elements of it. There's participation, there's going and seeing, and there's showing respect for the individual. Bill Belichick, and by the way, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm from New York, so I'm a New York Jets fan, so it really kills me to talk about Bill Belichick. But in a lot of respects, he really uh, is emblematic of this idea of participation. He is on the field all the time, and going and seeing. He's on the field all the time, both during games and during workouts. He models the, extra, the drills and the moves that he wants players to do. He doesn't just phone it in, literally or metaphorically. He's there to help them actually practice. And that engenders an enormous amount of respect and makes him incredibly effective. Art Byrne, who the author of The Lean Turnaround, the head of Wiremold, said, you know, you can't just send a memo. You've got to lead it. You've got to show by example. You have to do it on the shop floor. You have to learn by doing. And if you want to see what that looks like, it looks like this. This is Paul Akers, the CEO of FastCap. There he is, company president, and he's showing people how to scrub toilets. He's on his hands and knees, and he literally is cleaning the bathroom. And in fact, if you ever go visit him uh, as a company, he, uh, part one of the conditions is that you, the president of your company, has to be willing to clean the toilets with him. So this is an element of this idea of going and seeing and participating. This, exact, this is the premise, really, of uh, Undercover Boss. The reason it's so popular is because, because there are all these bosses that don't go and see, that they don't participate in doing these things. Now, in your company, you may not need to be cleaning the uh, oiling and cleaning the machines every day or answering customer service phone calls every day or processing invoices every day. But once a week or once a month wouldn't be the worst idea in the world. The last element of 
of effective coaching is showing respect. And showing respect is an idea that I think has, has gotten a lot of press recently in, um, in, in the lean community. And to me, showing respect means showing respect for people's ability to learn, for people's ability to grow, for people's ability to solve problems on their own instead of you solving problems for them. Mike Rother did a wonderful job with his book, Toyota Kata. If you don't know it, it's a terrific book. It's worth buying. But he talks about these five questions that you're supposed to ask people as you're training them and coaching them through problem solving. And what's really powerful about this is that by asking these five questions, it short circuits your tendency and the natural human tendency to give answers. Because it, it's, they're all open-ended questions, it's quite scripted, and what we're forcing people to do is learn. And what we're forcing the questioner, the coach, the manager, the supervisor, the VP to do is we're forcing him or her to not ask, uh, to give, or not, to not give answers. And to me, this is a very powerful way of showing respect. We're trying to give people the opportunity to learn and grow on their own. And when you look at the great coaches, that's what they do. They participate, they go and see, and they show respect for people's ability to grow. Before I turn it over to questions, I want to finish with this quote from a friend of mine. Carolyn Brodsky is the president of Sterling Rope, which is one of the last American climbing rope uh, and emergency rope manufacturers in the US. And she says the most powerful improvement tool we have is our employees' brains. We owe it to ourselves, we owe it to our companies, we owe it to them to start using, to allow them to use and develop their brains in the best possible way. And that is the epitome of effective coaching. And with that, I'll turn it over to Mark. Dan, thanks so much. Um, thank you for uh, a really interesting and thought-provoking uh, presentation. There are some questions that have been coming in and I'd encourage people uh, to go ahead and um, enter your questions. While that's happening, I just want to uh, either tell uh, attendees or remind attendees of some of the other resources and free information that's available on our Kinexus website. We have a whole library of uh, recorded webinars that you can uh, access on a lot of topics related to continuous improvement and lean and leadership. Uh, I've done some of these webinars. Uh, Dr. Greg Jacobson, our CEO, has done some of these. We've had other outside guest presenters, so I'd encourage you to check that out at kinexus.com slash webinars. And we also have a blog. If you go to blog.kinexus.com, um, we've got uh, interesting posts uh, all the time over there. So I would encourage you to, uh, to check that out. Our next webinar, we normally try to give a little bit better visibility. We're not trying to be uh, secretive or mysterious here. We are still um, trying to uh, finalize the webinar, we will email everybody who's attended here or everyone who's participated in webinars in the past. Uh, we're targeting about a month from now, either Tuesday, November 10th or Thursday, November 12th. We're either going to have uh, one of our customers from a health system telling uh, some of their story um, or Greg Jacobson and I might do. We've had somebody suggest doing a Q&A webinar where people would submit questions in advance and we'll just do nothing but respond um, to questions that come uh, from folks. So with that, let's get to uh, the Q&A uh, for Dan. Um, Dan, actually, I'm, I'm going to indulge myself and ask a, a question first. Um, if you can elaborate a little bit on um, on the Paul Akers story in the picture there. I love Paul. He's got an amazing amount of energy and passion for continuous improvement. You know, some might look and see, my goodness, why shouldn't the CEO be spending their time on things other than cleaning the toilets. The CEO has got to be the CEO. Why is he cleaning toilets? That seems, uh, that, that might be puzzling. Um, how, you know, I, from your understanding of it, how does that activity that he's doing there, how does that affect the culture or set a tone for the organization in, in your view at least? I think there, there, there are two issues here, Mark. And one is that it's a, it's a false choice to say that our CEO should be setting strategy and doing big picture stuff and shouldn't mm -hmm. be cleaning toilets, uh, that you can only do one or the other. I think there's plenty of room for both. Uh, again, that doesn't mean that Paul necessarily has to clean the toilet every day, uh, but it's important for him 
uh, important for the company for people to see, holy crap, this is important. This is so important. Keeping this place organized and clean and making the bathroom a pleasant place is so important that even the president will get down on his knees and clean. And you know, we, we, people often talk about, well, leaders have to, it's really hard to get people to embrace these changes. It's really hard to get people to try a new way of thinking or working or acting. And I think if you see a demonstration like this, you all of a sudden think, wow, this really is important. And not only is it important, if it's important enough for him to do it, I can do it too sometimes. Yeah. As opposed to it feeling like, boy, this is, this is just a lousy job that I have to do when the CEO is sitting in his swank mahogany yeah, offices right. with the leather chairs. I mean, so I think this, symbolically it's incredibly important. Yeah, I mean, symbolically, I mean, it, it demonstrates a lot of humility, which I mean, I think is an important thing uh, to model within an organization. Absolutely, absolutely. And again, uh, why is why is Undercover CEO a uh, a popular show? I, I assume it's popular. I know that when it came out, it was. It's because we want to giggle and say, "Oh, look at look at the CEO. Look how disconnected she is from from daily life at at the at the, our offices." And when you see that, you realize that there's no disconnect, that the, that the, the leadership uh, doesn't see themselves as, as being cut from a different cloth. You know, Mark, I, I know you, you used to work at GM, and mm -hmm. if I recall correctly, GM used to have a, they, of course, there's underground parking there because it's Detroit, and there's, it's cold and snowy in the winter, and there was a, an elevator that went from the basement to the 14th floor of one of the buildings, the executive suite, that didn't stop anywhere except on the 14th floor. Well, and, and, was, yeah, and, it, and, and, it, it, and it doesn't make it any better, but a lot of companies have, have been exposed for having that uh, exclusive executive CEO where they don't have elevator, where they don't have to be bothered by people. Exactly. And, and Paul Akers is the, is the polar opposite of that. Yeah. He's out there with his people, and he's cleaning the bathrooms with them. So we um, so we have a couple questions that came in about leadership. Um, one of them asks, you know, uh, Dan, it's pretty important to get buy-in, quote unquote, from leadership. What kind of approaches have been more effective uh, with with your clients? That's a terrific question, and I think in some respects it's a sixty-four thousand dollar question. That everyone says, well, we need leadership buy-in. We need leadership buy-in. How do we do that? I think first of all. Um, Speaking it, back to my original point about we always talk about Toyota and we talk about we're talking something about something that's relatively alien to a lot of a lot of companies and a lot of people. What would happen if we talked about Bill Belichick? What would happen if we talked about John Wooden? What would happen if we talked about a great? Um, it doesn't have to be a sports metaphor. Yeah. We talked about a great conductor. That conductor is out there every day with the musicians. That conductor is showing them how to play. Bill Belichick is out there coaching. John Wooden, no, he wasn't He wasn't dunking over Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, but he was showing Kareem Abdul-Jabbar how to run, uh, how to run a, screen, a, screen, a screenplay. So I think that suggesting to them that the really great leaders are doing these things, that's a way to appeal to them, first of all, to appeal to their pride, hey, you want to be a great leader too, right? You want to be the Bill Belichick of your industry. I think that's a really important way to appeal to their pride and at the same time give them a model that they're able to say, oh, yeah, I, I, I get that. I understand what Bill Belichick is like as opposed to saying, let me tell you about this guy named Tai Chi Ono who lived in, <laughs> who used to walk around the Toyota shop floor in the 1960s. And he's going to say, yeah, that's Toyota, that's Japan, that was 50 years ago, uh, not really interested. So I think that's a really important uh, uh, a way to start that conversation, um, and another way to get to 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 be have start getting leadership involved. I think is to start going on field trips. Go to honestly go out to Fast Camp, <laughs> go out to see Paul Akers, and go and have your president scrub the toilet. Um, cool. That will and he'll see not just the toilet scrubbing, right. but he'll see oh. the 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 attitude and the environment and the culture that he's created at FastCap, and I think that will be incredibly powerful and dramatic. But at, at the same time, I think a CEO going and cleaning the toilets doesn't magically become a Paul Akers either. 
Fair enough. That's exactly right. But uh, to quote John Shook, and maybe one of the most overused quotes of, of, of the last 10 years, it's easier yeah. to, to act your way into a new way of thinking than think your way self into a new way of acting. Yeah. Uh, so no, it doesn't make you into Paul Akers, but it's a step in the right direction. Yeah. Um, there's another question here. Um, recent survey found that 55% of global CEOs say that culture in mindset is a main challenge to their organization becoming more innovative. What tools or techniques can you use to understand and close that gap? That is a big question. And I don't know if I, honestly, I don't know if I have the answer for that. Um, Mark, could I punt that one to you? <laughs> yeah, it's, I mean, uh, I mean, I think the, the first thing is understanding the gap. I mean, I would propose, I think a lot of times people talk and talk and really, big, broad, vague terms. We need to be more innovative. And I think people don't have any idea what that means. Or we need to change our culture. And I don't think they diagnose the current state of the existing culture. Those are at least some of the first steps I would I would propose to maybe going in. But yeah, you know, I think it's good lean problem solving to try to understand the current state and try to understand your gap before you talk about what to do about it. One of the things that, as you say that, Mark, that makes me think about um, this note, Edward Schein's notion about uh, culture and, and visual art, visible artifacts and so on. If we're trying to change the culture, you can't just proclaim from the top of the mountain, we're going to change the culture, we're going to be more innovative, or we're going to be more friendly, or we're going to be more collaborative, or whatever it is. We have to start creating the artifacts that enable people to act differently, and there were the small behaviors that, that change the way uh, people, uh, the small behaviors that change the way people think about the company. And so I, I think about the, the first example that I was talking about, the committing to improvement and the notion of making suggestions visible. Instead of putting them in a suggestion box, we put them out on the wall and we create a small behavior, a commitment change that uh, a supervisor will respond to each suggestion within, let's say, 24 hours or 48 hours, whatever the number is. That small change creates a, starts shifting the culture. People say, wow, my ideas are important. Wow, I'm being listened to. Um, and Mark, you of course did a fantastic webinar about how to, about, about improvement and getting companies to start embracing improvement. Um, you can ask for improvement, you can modify their requests and so on. There are a lot of ways to, in order to make sure that those suggestions don't just end up saying, with a sorry no to expensive no, we can't do it. And I think if we start doing things like that, if we think about the little things that we can do, in time we can start to create a more a culture that supports innovation. Yeah. As long as we can identify some of those small things that are um, that are tied to innovation, and maybe it's you know recognition of risks taken. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's an award. There's a company I can't remember, or a couple companies I can't remember which they are that actually give prizes each quarter for experiments that failed. Mm, interesting. Because we want to say, hey, listen, let's try stuff. Don't sink the company, but if you try something and it was a good effort, we're going to reward you. We're going to honor you. We're going to give you a little statue and, and hold you up as an example of what to do. And next time, hopefully, your experiment's going to succeed. So things like that, the small things, I think, are a way to start making, to start turning the, the battleship of culture. Well, Dan, uh, thank you for um, the presentation and for addressing some questions. We've got some other questions we didn't get to. Maybe uh, I'm just going to think out loud here, Dan. Maybe you and I can do a podcast and, and just kind of um, talk through some of these other questions and, and discuss things a little, a little bit uh, a little bit more. Be happy to do it as a podcast, or if you want, we could uh, we could also set up a web page or something with uh, with the extra Q and A written out. Okay. Whatever, whatever is easy for you and for for uh, for the audience. Okay. Well, good. Well, thank you for. Uh, we'll, we'll we'll keep you on the hook for that. Thank you for signing up for that, <laughs> and uh, thank you for um, talking about um, about your uh, your your book today. Um, people can learn more about that by going to uh, markovitzconsulting.com. You can search Amazon or other bookstores uh, for building the fit organization. So I want to. I uh, thank Dan for, uh, for for presenting, and thank uh, everybody for attending here this afternoon on behalf of the team at Kinexus. Thanks.